Good afternoon, Green Mountain Care Board members. I would like to introduce you to our lead team. Uh, we have with us Christopher Doherty, who is our President and Chief Executive Officer. Dr. Kathleen McGraw, she's our Chief Medical Officer. Laura Bruno, she's our Chief Financial Officer. And Jackie Ethier, our Chief Nursing Officer. And they will be doing the presentation today, but I have a few words that I would just like to kick off the meeting with. And again, good afternoon. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Chair Foster and board member Dr. Merman for taking the time to meet with our CEO and me prior to our community meeting presented by Dr. Hamery. It was educational for me that you shed light on the challenges facing not only all of our hospitals, but our state as well. Challenges we are all too familiar with. The time to take action hopefully has not slipped away, but this is not time for inaction. It is a time for improvement, for change and transformation. That is why our proposed budget, which has been thoroughly reviewed by our community board, has been strategically and thoughtfully developed with our unique community in mind. Our team is committed to sustaining the health of our community within our means. We are dedicated to the provision of services and quality health care for all of our patients. Our budget stresses these goals, is responsive to community needs, and is financially sound and responsible. I express my appreciation to the entire BMH team for their willingness to go the extra mile and to present a well-balanced, cohesive budget to you today. Thank you. Well, I would just like to echo uh, Rhonda's gratitude uh, to Chair Foster, Dr. Merman, and all the Green Mountain Care Board members, and also especially to the Green Mountain um, Board staff. Um, we really appreciate the work that you do each and every day to uh, make this a better place for all Vermonters and to help us uh, navigate the uh, treacherous waters of healthcare. Um, 2024 is a great year. It actually marks the 120th anniversary of BMH being a community hospital. It's pretty remarkable in this day and age that a small independent rural hospital can survive for 120 years and hopefully 120 more. Um, when we reflect on our very rich history, we realize that BMH was started all because of love. It started because Thomas Thompson fell in love with Elizabeth Rawls on his visits as he would travel from uh, Massachusetts where he was a very successful businessman through Brattleboro into Vermont. He fell in love with Elizabeth and eventually they married. And the two of them, because of their generosity and the love for this community, uh, decided that they would make sure that a char charitable foundation was developed to support charitable efforts here in Brattleboro. Uh, it was easy to see that this community needed and desired a high quality um, community hospital here in Brattleboro. So they created Brattleboro Memorial Hospital and that's how we got started. Now, as Rhonda mentioned, uh, we had a great education from Chair Foster, Dr. Merman, Dr. Hamery about the challenges that we face. Uh, I think it's important to note that again, through our very rich history of 120 years, uh, BMH has sustained and actually thrived through many challenges, including world wars. Um, they've I've survived through floods, epidemics, um, and multiple, multiple changes in healthcare payment reform. And the reason why BMH has been able to continue to sustain through all of this through 120 years is because of persistent, even relentless efforts uh, to make sure that this treasured community hospital stays in Brattleboro. Though lots have changed in these 120 years, a couple of things have never changed. We still have this great love for the community and that's what propels us into action each and every day here at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. And we also still have the same sole purpose for existence and that is to serve this community. That has not changed. We're still very persistent. Uh, and even relentless in our efforts to keep this community hospital and this community treasure here in Brattleboro.
So fast forward to today, 2024, 120 years later, and uh, Laura, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and here's what we are. We are still an independent nonprofit community hospital. Just a reminder to everybody, we are the only Medicare dependent hospital in Vermont. We also do get a low volume adjustment uh, for um, uh, the, the, from the Medicare dependent hospital program. Uh, what we are today is that our Medicare spend per beneficiary is less than the national average um, because we have become a very efficient, high quality organization. Uh, we're a large employer for this community, which is very important to hopefully stimulating economic growth in our community. And we've become much more than a hospital, but much more like an integrated delivery system where we also uh, have a community, uh, a medical group, we have community uh, affiliations and ties that makes us much more of an integrated delivery system. Laura, can we move the slide ahead actually? You know, now, um, Gina, Gina has the slides uh, right now. We're just having this minor technical difficulty. Okay. Oh, thanks. All right. Well, you can kind of see it in the small corner there, but we have an enterprise-wide balance scorecard because we have seven key strategic priorities that we seek to fulfill each and every day, uh, and um, we strive to help utilize this to monitor how well we're doing towards fulfilling our mission as an organization. Um, we report this to our board uh, once a month, and these results fuel our continuous improvement uh, culture here at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. Uh, I am actually delighted to introduce Dr. Kat McGraw, our Chief Medical Officer, and she's going to talk about continuous improvement here at Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. Dr. McGraw, if you would just take a quick break and let us get, you bet. Let us get this squared away. Apologies for the technical difficulty. <clears throat> it's totally on my <laughs> Jump it any time. You're sworn in. Okay. You can go one more ahead to Dr. McGraw's slide, please, go. Dana. Thank you. Great. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So we can do it, do it with slides. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, BMH's investment in um, quality and patient safety um, and our ongoing work on continuous improvement in that. Um, approximately three years ago, we started working with the ACHE Blueprint for a Culture of Safety, and this involved get, um, bringing our board and community members and staff together to really look at um, how we do things and do really an inventory of our practices and the ways in which we can shift our focus so that we had um, some increase in a real culture of safety. And that has been um, tremendous. And um, I think you can feel it here at the hospital in a way that's really um, encouraging and exciting. Um, uh, each, the, the number of quality improvement projects that are going on around the organization is just tremendous. And uh, each fall we're holding a quality showcase where there are many, many um, projects that are proudly displayed. And uh, most of our leadership has been Yellow Belt um, certified for Lean Six Sigma. And there's just really a big shift here. And the nice thing about that is that we're starting to see some outcomes for that. Um, uh, outside of our organization, we are getting some recognition, which is nice. Um, the LeapFrog uh, uh, grading, which I'm sure you're familiar with, has uh, consistently been giving us a B grade on safety now. Our HCAP scores have continued to improve year over year, <clears throat> and we've uh, also uh, consistently been getting a four-star rating for that. Our CMS stars are also four stars on quality, um, which is uh, a delight as well. 
Uh, recently, the Laun Institute, who I know you all are familiar with, or at least some of you are, because I've seen that come up in some of the previous um, uh, discussions, uh, recognized us uh, twice. Once, um, we were uh, cited as the most socially responsible acute care hospital in Vermont. Um, and uh, really, that's the social responsibility and the health equity um, are uh, based on about 50 different metrics for which which most of them we received A's and B scores. Um, so that is pretty exciting. Um, and also with respect to community benefit in April, we were noted um, to have the uh, best fair share score in um, Vermont and really a, a good one uh, relative to the rest of the country as well. And that particular um, score is uh, meant to measure our community investments and free care. Um, our work around quality of care, delivery and patient safety um, is in line with the Lown Institute's um, goal of um, doing as much as possible for the patient and as little as possible to the patient um, as we work to achieve health equity and eliminate health care disparities. Um, another oops, next slide, please. There we go. Another way in which we've seen some of this um, outcome is around the value-based purchasing program with CMS. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, they withhold 1% um, of our DRG base payment and then um, add that back based on certain quality metrics. Um, those metrics are largely focused on um, orthopedic outcomes and um, mortality rates on uh, uh, some specific um, common and uh, uh, significant uh, disease states. Um, and as you can see here on that um, car curve, BMH is the green line and we are ahead of the curve, which I'm really happy to report. Um, and this means that they have um, given us uh, not just our 1% um, back again for the quality metrics, but also a little bit of a boost at that 0.16 added to it, um, really based on um, our quality care metrics. And I will just add that earlier this week, I heard that for this next year, we've had continued improvement and we will um, see our, our bonus be 1.38, um, which is even a little bit uh, better um, and reflective of the care that we've been delivering. Next slide. And then thirdly, I want to um, just point to a, a really thrilling um, uh, recognition, which is um, the CMS, our CMS Quality Improvement Organization um, is IPRO, and they uh, chose to nominate us for a uh, New England um, uh, award for quality improvement, and this is the poster that they actually put together for part of that um, that nomination process. Um, that it was uh, around our reduction in readmissions project around heart failure and COPD, and um, it is a project that is incredibly interdisciplinary across the full continuum of care. You can see the photo in tiny little pictures down below, but those folks represent you know pharmacy, inpatient, outpatient, and the full range of uh, of touch points for patients and we made changes based on data 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 and um, and input from patients and staff and we have really seen um, decreases in our readmissions for um, both heart failure and COPD and continue to see that and I'm happy to say that we actually won the award that we were uh, nominated for so that was a real thrill and I think the thrill about it is not so much the recognition per se although it's nice and it's great and really essential for the staff and for the work that we do but it really just represents that we are seeing outcomes in quality of care, outcomes in readmission, reductions um, in ways that are palpable and meaningful for the work and the investment that we've put into it. And now I'll turn it over to Laura. Actually, uh, it's Chris. I'm going to do this one, but thanks, uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. McGraw. Thanks for talking about continuous improvement. And that continuous improvement is the foundation for all we do here. We try and get 1% better each and every day. And that'll be very thematic throughout the presentation today. Just a few other things we'd like to highlight is that we are uh, still in the recovery mode from the uh, awful change healthcare cyber attack and the financial impacts it had. Uh, we use change healthcare, which is owned by United, um, we use them as our claim scrubber and uh, claims clearing house. And so we, uh, it was down for over a month um, because of a cyber attack. Uh, 
some ransomware um, uh, challenges uh, that really created a, a major problem throughout the country, but hit us very hard because we weren't able to get claims out the door, nor were we, were we able to post payments for almost two months. Thanks to Laura Bruno, our chief financial officer's great work, um, we have been able to manage our way through, but there's still a lot of catch up in terms of accounts receivable coming in uh, that needs to, to continue to happen uh, as we uh, survive that uh, terrible attack. Um, we are looking at some targeted growth in very specific outpatient areas. And this is because, as Dr. Hamery pointed out so well, uh, Vermont is very much an aging uh, state. Uh, we happen to sit in the county that is the oldest county in the state of Vermont, Wyndham County. And we're seeing the impact of that on uh, the care that we deliver a lot more chronic illnesses, a lot more cardiology, a lot more cancer, a lot more podiatry. Uh, so we're trying to beef up some of those services and some of the growth that Laura will talk about when she submit, when she presents our budget, will be in these outpatient areas that we're looking to grow and especially in our Medicare insured patient base. Um, I think it's important for us to talk about some of the big things we're doing for cost-saving efforts. Uh, there's a million things we're doing on a daily basis to save costs. That is the one thing that uh, no matter how you look at healthcare, costs need to be removed from healthcare, and we're looking at ways to do it. Uh, we're looking at some big things, and two of them are listed here. Uh, one of them, I, I just noticed a, a typo, and boy, am I going to get a hard time from uh, Joe Wooden and Peter Wright. Uh, we are transitioning to the NECHN, which you've heard about from both Peter and Joe, the New England Collaborative Health Network. And yes, it's for group purchasing, but more importantly, I, I think it's also for shared service opportunities. Uh, we're continuing to share services with the Brattleboro Retreat, which is 1.6 miles away from us as it relates to information systems. And uh, we're, we're getting some great opportunities through this collaborative. And I, I know Joe and Peter have talked about that. We're also very uh, much partnering with a, uh, a very uh, solid federally qualified health center uh, close by to bring a federally qualified health center to Brattleboro. Wyndham County is the only county in the state of Vermont without a federally qualified health center. And there are great advantages for the community for us partnering with a federally qualified health center. And we're in the midst of doing that. Um, so these are some of the big things that from a theme uh, perspective you'll hear. Uh, Gina, you can go to the next slide, please. Just a couple of highlights of some other things that we're doing. Um, innovation is such a vitally important part of uh, what we need to be doing for transformation. We're very proud to say that we've launched a mobile integrated health network uh, with Rescue Inc. as a community partner. They are, are uh, an AMS, AMS service located about a block and a half from us. Uh, and in this, we actually have community paramedics going out to the homes of individuals to try and keep people in their homes, keep them out of coming to the emergency department if it's avoidable, and keep them out of being admitted to the hospital if it's avoidable. Now, we started with a very small, finite uh, subset, and that was really our joint replacement surgery patients, where the community paramedics go into the homes prior to surgery to make sure that it's safe for the patient to come back. Uh, hopefully the same day that they have the surgery to their home. Uh, then they visit them the day of surgery, making sure that their pain is being managed and keep visiting them uh, on a regular basis to try and make sure there's no surgical site infections, that their mobility is good, and that they're taking their pain medication in a responsible way. Uh, we've seen some great outcomes from that. And what we're really excited to do is to start really working on the areas where mobile integrated health can reduce healthcare costs substantially, and that's with the chronically ill. So we're starting with COPD, and then we will migrate into CHF. We've, we've even talked to Blue Cross Blue Shield to see if there are certain pain points in terms of diagnosis that this might be something uh, that we can partner with them on to try and bring down costs for everyone. Um, 
we're experimenting uh, with artificial intelligence. We're very excited about how it may impact us uh, in terms of efficiency into the future. We have a few different projects that we're looking at at this point in time. We've started to do some clinical documentation work uh, 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 with artificial intelligence with the goal of uh, having our providers be uh, more efficient in their documentation so that they can spend time on uh, caring for patients. Uh, we've also started to explore and look at potential of artificial intelligence in claims processing uh, and actually working with denials management as well. And then finally, we're looking at implementing a digital front door where artificial intelligence would help us in managing inboxes for clinicians, uh, uh, messages that come in for clinicians, and making that process much more efficient than it's been. Dr. McGraw mentioned that we've been infusing Lean and Six Sigma into our uh, leadership team. I think all of our directors have been trained and are now yellow belts uh, for Lean Six Sigma, and that's becoming a, a big part of our culture here at BMH. Uh, I think you've probably heard an awful lot about the New England Collaborative Health Network. We're very excited about the potentials. I kind of think the potential is pretty much uh, only limited by imagination, and uh, uh, there's a lot that can be done to reduce the cost of health care, not just in hospitals, but also with our community partners, and we're actively looking at community partners who we can bring into this collaborative. Uh, we're actively preparing for the AHEAD model, uh, and we've talked about partnering with a federally qualified health center, which will help us bring down costs because we will be able to share those costs over to the federally qualified health center, especially for primary care here. You can go to the next slide, and I believe now I'm going to introduce Laura Bruno, our chief financial officer. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so I'm going to walk us through uh, our budget proposal for FY25. Um, starting off with just a look at the fiscal year-to-date May 2024 performance. Um, so despite, you know, as Chris mentioned, facing some considerable headwinds with the cyber attack from uh, Change Healthcare this fiscal year, our performance, um, our financial performance has actually been relatively strong. When we look at the year-to-date May 2024 period, revenues came in favorably. Um, driven by the medical group, uh, radiology and, and pharmacy primarily, with offsets in uh, operating room and, and emergency room volumes. Um, wages are also favorable to budget by 2.1%. During uh, FY24, we launched a smart hiring committee to put form and discipline around spend on new hires, both in clinical and administrative roles. We have put a few um, tactics in place as part of that process, eliminating repeat postings that carry over from year to year, requiring business justification for any unbudgeted hires, and setting financial thresholds to justify even budgeted hiring. We're also in the process of launching a position control system. We experienced contract labor overspend of 1.7 million, um, which is partly related to um, RN shortage, but also is starting. We're starting to feel um, a shortage in, in some of the allied health roles, uh, technical roles, in radiology um, and lab. Uh, contracted services were favorable uh, due to the mainly to the impact of change healthcare cyber attack, which in effect put a lot of our projects on hold. Uh, because of the cash constriction. In total, uh, year-to-date May, we're reporting a loss of $115,000. For our FY24 full-year projection, uh, we're forecasting favorability on net operating revenue of $2.8 million, or 2.4% versus budget. We expect to see wage favorability continue um, and approximate uh, 1.1 million or 2.2% versus budget due to the disciplines that I mentioned on the previous page. We will overspend on contract labor by about 2.5 million due to 
lack of availability, as I mentioned, of technical hires for radiology and lab roles. Um, we had strategically set the contract labor budget low in FY24. Contracted services are favorable due to spend avoidance in this year. Um, worth noting that healthcare provider tax will exceed budget by $650,000 this year. Uh, and for the full year, we're projecting a loss of $172,000. So um, <clears throat> this is kind of a truncated balance sheet for FY24 uh, mid-year. As Chris mentioned, we were impacted by the cyber attack on Change Healthcare, which is the parent company of our claims processor, Assurance. This nationwide event dramatically affected our balance sheet dynamics, including cash, AR, and AP. We are still very much recovering from the outage, uh, and the balance sheet reflects this recovery period. You can see that just between April and May of 2024, we experienced a pretty dramatic decrease in both AR and AP. We have been working hard to clear out the claims that were backlogged in our EHR as quickly as possible, thanks to a concerted effort from our revenue cycle team. Our AR levels are slowly declining as a result. The lack of cash flow during the outage made it nearly impossible for us to pay our vendors and we fell behind on AP. We received short-term emergency funding from OneCare Vermont, Medicare, and Medicaid, which allowed us to sustain operations at that challenging time. BMH made commitments during the outage to continue to pay our employees and to sustain all patient care despite these financial challenges. And I'm proud to say that we adhered to those commitments. Our balance sheet fundamentals continue to be strong, and we are seeing working capital improve each month as we gain some distance from the cyber attack. <clears throat> so the budget comparison, uh, the second column highlighted in yellow on this slide is our budget P&L for FY25. We're projecting 302 million in revenues, which is a 7.8% increase over FY24's budget. We're planning, as Chris mentioned, for growth in cardiology, podiatry, um, and to a kind of lesser extent, ortho, um, and as an ancillary to um, cardiology, podiatry, and ortho, and MRI, and, and echocardiography. We are planning for our inpatient services to remain relatively consistent in volume year on year. Um, our NPR uh, fixed perspective payment increase is set at 2.5%. We're projecting 4.8% growth in wages despite holding our headcount virtually flat. The year on year dollar growth in wages reflects our collective bargaining agreement increases as well as our need to compete in a tough labor market with employers from Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Growth and benefits spend will roughly align with the wages, uh, the wage growth that we're seeing. Um, we again budgeted a million dollars for contract labor in hopes to continue to decrease our reliance on travelers. Med surge supplies and drugs lines are up primarily due to the fact uh, that we had under budgeted for those areas in FY24, but also you know, obviously we're experiencing inflationary impact in those lines in particular. Other supplies and expenses are increasing by 13.8%, mainly due to fuel costs, which increased by 8.2%. Um, due to the expiration of a fixed contract that we had on fuel. Depreciation and amortization reflects the non-cash impact of CIP projects, plus the projects that we are planning to undertake in capital this year. Our budget for the provider tax is up 10.5% or $600,000 versus last year. And overall, we are presenting a small positive margin of $551,000 or 0.46%. Chris, 
Chris, would you like to address the next slide? Thanks, Laura. Yes, uh, Laura is about to uh, go through uh, our rate request with you all, and I thought I'd just give a little bit of a backdrop before she does that. Uh, there's other challenges. Uh, Dr. Hamery did such a nice job, and the whole Oliver Wyman team, of pointing out all the challenges that we all face. Uh, there were some things that some are specific to us uh, from the federal government uh, 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 perspective, as well as some things that uh, we would love to work on with the state. Uh, so from the federal government perspective, we are a Medicare dependent hospital with a low volume adjustment and, and that accounts for about $3 million to our bottom line each year. Um, unfortunately, that's always at risk because that has to be approved by the federal government. It, it actually takes an act of Congress to keep the Medicare dependent hospital low volume adjustment program in place. Uh, we're assured that it's in place through uh, December 31st of 2024, but somehow Congress has to agree before December 31st, 2024 to put it in to a longer period of time. There is a U.S. Senate bill that would make this permanent, and we're certainly hopeful for that. As a Medicare-dependent hospital, I think it's important for you all to hear as you look at our rate requests that we do not get a increase from Medicare OPPS payments. Um, I believe we're the only hospital in the state of Vermont that does not benefit from any increase uh, in OPPS, and that is because of our Medicare-dependent hospital status. Uh, you may know that Medicare set their IPPS rates at a 2.9% increase for next year, uh, but they lowered the physician payment by, I believe, or are going to lower the physician payment by about 1.7%. I think from the state perspective, you know, uh, Laura's mentioned a couple of times the provider tax and that it's about $6.7 million that we pay in provider tax. And we have no problem paying provider tax. I just would point out that that rate is at 6%, uh, which is the max allowed by the federal government. Uh, and in most states, it's an average of about 3 to 4%. In most states, um, there is a relationship between the disproportionate share payment and your provider tax. Uh, for us, we get about 10% of our provider tax back in disproportionate share. Uh, Laura, please correct me if I'm wrong, but next year, I believe uh, we're actually going to receive $40,000 less, less in disproportionate share. Even correct, so that will get less than, less than 10% of our provider tax. Even though our provider tax is going up over $500,000 in most states, the disproportionate share relationship to provider tax is closer to 50%. Actually, in neighboring uh, New Hampshire, I believe it's 71%. Um, so some things to hopefully consider in a collaborative way with the state as we look at things. I think the only other thing I'd like to point out is that, uh, you know, also factored into this, uh, our rate increase request is that uh, we found out kind of in the middle of the budget process that uh, Medicaid is not going to offer any rate increase for fiscal year 25, which again creates a challenge for um, our expenses, inflation, everything are going up substantially. Um, we're doing everything we can to reduce costs, uh, but there's very little in terms of levers we can pull to increase revenue. And I'll turn it back over to Laura, I believe. Thank you. So uh, this slide is a review of our charge request. Um, overall, on a blended basis, we're presenting a charge increase of 2.7%. This breaks out to 1.5% on professional fees and supplies and 3.2% on the hospital. Broken out by payer, we are reflecting the Medicare IPPS rate increase of 2.9%, a 0% increase from Medicaid, and a commercial rate request of 4.7%. Our NPR with fixed prospective payment will represent a 2.5% increase over FY24, and we're planning for a small operating margin of $551,000.
In terms of volumes, budget to budget, we're projecting consistent, relatively flat performance in our core inpatient units, such as the birthing center, um, progressive care unit, med surge two, and inpatient surgery. We are planning for modest growth in a couple of areas to support our aging population, as I mentioned earlier, so cardiology, um, podiatry, imaging, um, and orthopedics. So this next page is just a breakout of the key buckets of inflation that we're anticipating in FY25. We expect wages to increase by approximately 4.8% or 2.5 million. Drugs are inflated largely because of um, expensive infusions for cancer treatment, for which we are not typically fully reimbursed. Um, <clears throat> additionally, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, I believe under budgeted on this line for FY24. The healthcare provider tax is, uh, as, as we've mentioned, is mandated at 6% of NPR. So as we grow, it, it increases. This year it will increase by 10.5% or $600,000. Fuel, we uh, discussed on a previous slide. Uh, in total, we anticipate our inflationary impact to approximate $5.5 million. Capital. Um, <clears throat> we met as a capital committee um, internally at the MH to review all requests and either delay or defer any unnecessary requests, uh, capital requests to FY26 and beyond. The capital budget is really a result of that process of whittling down purchases to what was absolutely necessary for patient care, diagnostic services, and the upkeep of our physical plant. The most significant single capital investment in the plan is a replacement MRI. We anticipate the new MRI to be installed, hopefully, around January of 2025, if that all goes according to plan. A few other examples of planned capital are a nuclear medicine camera, new endoscopy platform and scopes, um, IT infrastructure equipment, new stretchers and patient beds where needed, and lab equipment. We're also prioritizing the safety and security of our physical plant and are making investments in that area. We're conducting an end-to-end -end revenue cycle engagement with Barry Dunn, uh, which is a consulting partner of ours. As a sub-project within that engagement, uh, we will be centralizing our scheduling and registration processes in order to improve patient access to our services. By centralizing scheduling and registration, we believe we will gain efficiencies that allow us to shorten wait times for visits and simplify communications between patients and clinicians. Another big area of focus in our revenue cycle engagement is growing patient participation in our financial assistance program. We are increasing our marketing of the program at our facility and in Wyndham County and aim to improve our ratio of charity care to bad debt over time. We're publicizing the benefits and eligibility requirements for Act 119 and we'll hope to gain traction with the program through these efforts. Pricing transparency is another focal point in this project. We want our patients to understand their bills from BMH and be able to accurately predict the cost of their visit to improve affordability overall. So the next two slides are risks and opportunities within the budget. So I'll just run through these quickly. Um, timing of the establishment of an FQHC in Wyndham County is unknown at this point, though we would like to see a conversion around the beginning of calendar 2025, but there is still a question around that. Um, we are facing an unpredictable labor market, specifically in technical roles in radiology uh, and lab, and we do see some challenges there. There is some 
Also some degree of unknown around the amount of volume we'll see corresponding to bringing on additional providers in cardiology and podiatry. Um, Wyndham County's population is aging and faces a greater likelihood of chronic illness, <clears throat> which does present uh, a greater financial risk uh, to VMH. And generally the growth of Medicare Advantage participation is a risk to VMH. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, Medicare dependent hospital and low volume adjustment designations are cyclically at risk and are set to expire on December 31st of 2024. Um, so we'll be looking out uh, at that horizon. Continued difficulties of getting patients to a higher or lower level of inpatient care is a risk for us. Um, and then as always, recruiting and retaining high quality providers. Um, as for opportunities, the FQHC is on both lists, risk and opportunity. Um, the establishment of an FQHC uh, in Wyndham County will improve access to care and services in our community, and it will also offer um, cost savings to BMH. Our transition to a new group purchasing organization will offer savings due to greater economies of scale in our purchasing. We are utilizing AI for scribe services in our medical group, which we think will improve provider retention by simplifying the process around dictation. Um, the revenue cycle project with Barry Dunn will drive efficiencies and increase cash collections at BMH, allowing us to invest in critical path items. And the expansion of mobile integrated health and community paramedics will reduce ED visits and avoidable readmissions. So um, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie Ethier, who is our chief nurse, nursing officer. Thank you, Laura. Uh, nice to see everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit more about our workforce uh, realities that we're facing. We're going to look at contract labor spend. I know this is small, but this is fiscal year over year spend since fiscal year 19. You can see the lighter blue is nursing specific. The darker blue are those uh, non-nursing roles. And in fiscal year 22, we experienced the post-COVID impacts uh, to our nursing workforce that many organizations saw required significant increase in, in those traveler resources. Luckily, since fiscal year 23, we're continuing to see a decrease in those uh, contract labor expenses for nursing, which we attribute to our focus on redesign of our new graduate nurse residency, as well as our ongoing recruitment and retention efforts for permanent staff. Um, as Laura had mentioned, we are experiencing an increase in allied health workforce needs. So specifically, as she has said, radiology, laboratory, as well as respiratory therapy, which is a critical resource for us here being a small community hospital, only having one respiratory therapist around the crop to meet all of our patient care needs. Um, so we're seeing those costs drive up with really lack of regional pipelines to uh, hire permanent staff into those roles. And so we have an ongoing opportunity there regionally to continue to develop those pipelines. Next slide, Laura. Thank you. So workforce challenges or opportunities, um, as Chris also mentioned earlier, the Oliver Wyman report really exemplified for all of us the workforce realities that are facing us in Vermont. So the aging population is projected to continue with a corresponding decline in our Force. So um, we're going to continue to have to face those challenges. As I already mentioned, the lack of pipelines, so that allied health lack of schooling and programs in our region is, is a reality we're facing right now, and we really need to lean into strategies uh, to address that moving forward. Um, it's important to know regarding our capacity that capacity is not just about physical space, um, that we must have the human and equipment resources to provide the complex care that we need, uh, which requires ongoing exploration and investment into the future. Um, as previously mentioned too, we continue to struggle with uh, uh, regional and seasonal surges where we lack the ability to transfer either to a lower or higher level of care, which creates internal surge for us and challenges that we have to address um, on a routine basis. Next slide, Laura. 
So workforce solutions, um, compensation obviously always comes up and you can see what we've projected for future spend on compensation. We recently implemented a new structure, uh, really working towards consistency and equity for, for all, all of us. Um, we continue to uh, partner with all of these organizations across the tri-state area, really working to um, in addition to working with the Vermont Talent Pipeline Advisory Group, we uh, are collaborating and strategizing with all of these individuals into the future um, to really grow these resources as we move forward. It's important to note about culture that the evidence tells us that most employees leave roles primarily due to their immediate work environment. Therefore, we're, we're deeply committed to supporting and developing our culture with the strategies listed here. So I think I'm handing it back to Laura, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Um, thank you, Jackie. So to summarize our FY25 budget proposal, we are presenting a 2.5% increase in NPR, a blended charge increase of 2.7%, and a bottom line margin of 0.46%. We believe this is a responsible budget request. Um, and there are three key focal points as we look towards FY25. Rebuilding and strengthening our operations with an eye towards sustainability. Putting community engagement at the forefront of all that we do. And becoming a population health focused system. Chris? Well, again, we want to thank you all for listening to our budget presentation. We're excited to entertain questions. Uh, before we uh, end, we would also like to thank you for, again, the very important work that you do each and every day uh, for the state of Vermont. It's commendable, it's admirable, and it's very vital to the success of this state and the health of our um, uh, beloved communities. Uh, I think as we look this budget that we're presenting you today is the first year of our next 120 years. Uh, we hope that you'll approve this budget. Uh, we're happy to discuss it with you in full, but we also believe that what's going to help us sustain for the next 120 years is uh, a lot of what has helped us get to where we are today. And that's that everything will be done out of love for this community. Um, and to also complete our noble mission of serving this community. We believe that the, uh, the attributes of persistence, innovation, and resilience are going to be vitally important uh, to our future. Uh, so just adding to what Voltaire has said uh, over 120 years ago, that no problem can withstand the assault of persistent thinking. We believe that's true, but Far be it for me to add to Voltaire, but I would say not only persistent thinking, persistent collaboration, persistent innovation, and most of all, now is the time for persistent action. So we thank you, Chair Foster and team, and we're ready for questions whenever you're. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. Um, I'll turn to Board Member Walsh for any questions he, he may have, and then the others. Uh, Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you, Chris. It's nice to see you again. Um, I wanted to start off by just uh, commending you and your the organization for your Leapfrog, HCAP, and Lao Institute recognition. I know um, you started in your role about the time that I joined this board, um, and it's, I believe, in the hard work that you're putting into things. Um, you also described in your narrative some efforts to address the free care to bad debt ratio and the consulting group that you're you're working with. I was wondering if you could say more about how the consultants are helping in that area. Yes. Um, so we're looking at putting more resources towards uh, benefits advocate, so kind of a financial counselor role. We have a uh, one person doing that role, but I think we need to not only market um, the program more and sort of flyer within our community and within our practices, um, but we also need to, you know, put more um, FTE type resources 
um, against that against that position so that we can um, you know meet our patients where they are and provide the education they need on the program and what benefits are available to them. If I might just add to that, Laura, also part of our implementation of a digital front door, which is really a patient portal on steroids, will make that much easier for people to fill out those type of applications, get that information, um, those that have uh, access to uh, this digital front door. So uh, trying to do that on multiple fronts because part of our challenge has also been getting people in to actually fill out these applications. So trying to meet them where they are uh, as well is important for us. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, that's, that's all good to hear. It's a topic that I want to come back to. Um, this one, I'm, I want to make sure um, that I have this right. You're requesting a 4.7% commercial charge increase, and the, the 27 was the blended, if I am got that that's, correct. That's correct. And the, and the NPR growth of 2.5. Yes. Um, in, the, in the narrative that you submitted, you noted that you'd planned a 3.4 um, commercial charge increase, but then the received notice that there was no increase from Vermont Medicaid this year, and that necessitated the change. Um, is the have you received word from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York about their Medicaid rates for the upcoming year? I have not, uh, Chris. I don't know if you've heard anything from them. Um, I have not, Dr. Walsh. That's a very good, good question. question. I have not, and I think it's something to explore. And I think that uh, is an important point uh, because we do get some patients from Medicaid uh, from New Hampshire and Massachusetts that are Medicaid. It's small. the The reason for the bump uh, in Vermont is that's about 20% of our patient population. And again, mm -hmm. the 60% is Medicare. Uh, so that was what threw us for a loop. It, it would have been nice if they had given that information to the Green Mountain Care Board as part of the budget guidance preparation. That I think would have helped us because we were headed down a path that we sort of got a curveball towards the end, sorry to say. But uh, it's yeah. a great suggestion. We'll look into both uh, New Hampshire and Massachusetts. Yeah, I think um, it, it, I started thinking about it because, it, again, in the narrative, you had mentioned that um, because of your where you're located and serving Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York, that the commercial charge increase you were, were requesting wouldn't have much of an impact on Vermont ratepayers. Um, so then I was wondering about if there's no change for Vermont Medicare, but there is change from other states, how all that would flush out. So the questions in my mind are what proportion of commercial paying patients are from Vermont and the other states? What proportion of your Medicare patients, Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, um, New Hampshire, and then what proportion of Medicaid patients? Um, that helped me understand why a 3.3% increase in commercial rate from what you had first thought um, won't substantially affect the population, the patients from Vermont who pay commercially, but a 0% change in Medicaid for Vermont would have a substantial impact on the budget. All right, so just trying to um, help me understand that and, and think that all through with you. So we know so, that about 25% of our, our commercial um, volume is from out of state. I, you yeah. know, how it breaks out by Massachusetts versus New Hampshire, I'd have to look into that to get the split. Yep. Um, yep. I, saw, I saw that in the, in the narrative, Laura, that 75% commercial from, um, within state. So that type of information um, so would I, help, Dr. Walsh, would help we, me understand. We, we need to get you that because I think on the Medicaid side, um, again, we get a very little bit. No state really likes to see the Medicaid go across state lines. So we don't right. get a lot from New Hampshire and Massachusetts, but I don't have those specific numbers. I will get it. 
In Medicare, it's actually kind of irrelevant since it's a federal program. It's going to be mm -hmm. the same payment no matter where. Plus, they've capped it in terms of uh, what it'll be 2.9% on the IPPS. Uh, we will not get any increase on the OPPS, which is what mm -hmm. is growing rapidly. And after Laura had started the budget again, Medicare did the same thing. CMS just maybe two weeks ago passed that they're going to lower the physician payment mm -hmm. by 1.7%, which also factored into that. But we can break that down for you. They're, they're great questions, Dr. Walsh, and we, we mm -hmm. can break that down. Okay. Um, I want, to, I want to switch next to um, a topic that you saw um, with Bruce when he was when he was there, the RAND 5.0 data. Um, when we look at that, we can compare relative price uh, for your facility to a break-even price that the RAND Corporation calculates. Your total facility price, um, as they uh, calculated, is 320% of Medicare. And the break-even price is 204. So that gap is 116 points. That gap is considered an assessment of efficiency and productivity. Um, the total facility percentage of 320 is the third highest in the state. And the gap to the break-even is also one of the highest. And so I I know you're very committed to your community, but I'm I'm wondering how um, your community can afford prices that relative to Medicare are the third highest in the state. So um, we'll dig into the RAND report and get back to you on that, Dr. Walsh. I, I can tell you that again, uh, as pointed out by CMS, our Medicare spend per beneficiary is actually less than the national average. Uh, we're at a 0.9 uh, for that, which is a barometer that we use constantly um, yep. to look at. Um, again, as we look at cost, we absolutely agree that cost is a challenge that we need to weed out. While we're doing lots of little things, we're also looking at lots of big things. Please also note that in that cost are things like the provider tax increases, um, uh, hit that. Uh, that is very abnormal for um, a, a state to have such a high, um, uh, again, provider tax rate. Uh, I think that that's important to note. Um, we are a Medicare dependent hospital, which also means that really the only the majority of our payments do come from Medicare. So it is really where we actually do have the biggest opportunity to um, to create a sustainable future for us. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's, um, you know, we had a bunch of presentations a couple of weeks ago about, um, you know, with the aging population, um, it makes sense strategically to be thinking about managing the organization um, to Medicare rates, right? Um, the the gap between the um, the faculty the facility price and the break even price of 116 points is um, is pretty large. So as you dig into that data and get more familiar with it, um, you'll be able to you'll be able to look on the website too how you compare to other places in Vermont. Um, but a hospital that we met with last week has a gap of 11 points. So just room for improvement Very there helpful. in efficiency and productivity. Very helpful, but, thanks. Sure, yeah, I, and I appreciate the, the back and forth with, with this, Chris, the, the dialogue and your openness. Um, I wanna take a look at, the, at your balance sheet for a moment. Um, your total assets were stable relatively from 2020 to 25. It was 101 million in 2020. 103 million in 2025. Um, Long-term debt increased from 7.3 million to 14.8 in the same time, with the largest jump occurring in 2022. I just I'd like to better understand that growth in long-term debt, if you if you yes. could. Um, we had a bond issuance that we used to build the Ron Reed Pavilion um, at at BMH, uh, so that's the that's the reason. 
Okay. Uh, it was one and a half million. I, I, I'm um, so, so I apologize for interrupting. I didn't. What was that number? If I can hear it again. Twelve and a half million. Thank you. Um, during that same, you know, 2020 to 2025, if we look at the profit and loss, the, the, the variance between the budgeted to actual bad debt amounts notably increased, right? In 2020, bad debt budget was 3.5, and the actual came in at 2.1. And then in 2021, it was budgeted at 3.4, came in at 2.8. 2022, 3.6, but came in at 4.8. Mm -hmm. 2023, 3.9, came in at 5.3. 2024, 4.6 to a projected six. So the, yeah. the, the variance between what's in your budget and then what is actually happening um, has grown considerably. Yes, um, that's exactly. So this is what I was referring to as the the ratio of charity care to bad debt that we're working on improving. This is a project that will take us some time, uh, but what we would like to see is a shift over time so that our free care and our bad debt, I'd like free care to be exceeding bad debt, um, yeah. but we're not, we're not quite there yet. We're putting, uh, we're putting some tactics in place to, to Great. help people, um, learn more about our financial assistance program and how they can qualify, but they have to sign, they have to sign up. During COVID, we, we saw um, a big drop off of people signing up because they just didn't want to come in and sign the papers. Um, mm -hmm. And then it just has stayed sort of stagnant um, mm -hmm. from there. And so we're putting some energy and effort behind um, promoting it right now. Right. I think that that's, it's, um, I understand the difficulty that you're describing, um, uh, but it, it's, it hasn't stayed stagnant, right? The, the free care or charitable care has decreased substantially in the same period from 2.8 million in 2020 to $615,000 in 2024. Mm -hmm. So, um, when I'm looking through those documents, those are things that are are jumping out at me. Yep, that, and that's what I'm saying. People are not signing up for the program; they're just not paying their bill, yep. which is not um, what we, you know, it's not the ideal solution. No, um, I want to uh, return to the narrative uh, for a minute in the contingency plan section. Um, under the contingency plan, uh, you wrote that any decrease in our proposed rate would, our, our proposed rate increase would threaten compliance with our bond covenants. Mm -hmm. um, I, could you help me understand how that's a contingency plan? Uh, what I was saying is that we are, um, beholden to the bondholders in the bank that we, where we have our bond issuance and we report to them on a biannual basis on a 12 month rolling uh, performance on our debt service coverage, um, our days cash on hand and, um, and other metrics. And specifically the debt service coverage would be impacted if our rate increase um, were compromised because it would lower our revenue and um, threaten the bottom line. So I, um, I understand what would happen, right? It's, it's, I don't have a personal bond co covenant, but I have a mortgage. And if I miss a payment or I make a partial okay. payment, I'd no longer be in compliance. And my ability to finance repairs for my 15-year-old Jeep would be compromised and then I could um, end up bankrupt or home could be repossessed or even the Jeep, right? which would not be good. Um, so I, I understand the, what, what's happening, but I, the contingency plan section, what we're looking for there is if we didn't grant the increase, 
how would you manage? Are you asking if we would stop services or um, some? That's what some. some that's what some. Time. That's what some facilities write in there. Um, there are other options, but um, that is the we're looking for is what would happen. Um, how would you deal with that scenario? Um, so let, let me just kind of just one more question. Let me just flip it around. Um, if we approved the commercial charge increase and the NPR increase, um, those the commercial charge increases above guidance. And so how that would be utilized to address the community needs that you've identified and the community benefits um, that you're providing, that type of information would also be useful, right? To, to, to see what are your priorities, what are your objectives, what are your key performance indicators to know that the overage that you're requesting is being used to meet community need and provide community benefit. Fantastic, and, uh, and I'll address that, Dr. Walsh. So uh, again, the budget is for a margin of $551,000. So uh, every dime of that gets reinvested back into what we do for the community. Um, one of the problems with having such small margins, which also goes back to the need for having margins, is you cannot invest in the future with no margin. Um, bond covenant or not. Uh, so artificial intelligence needs to be rampant in healthcare. Uh, it's impossible to invest in that without any margin. Uh, there's operational costs as well as capital costs that may be needed for that. Um, so we need a small margin to actually prepare for the future or we will not be here for another 120 years because the further we get behind, uh, the harder it is ever going to be to to get uh, to a sustainable future. So we look at all of this uh, a minimal margin as a chance to invest in our people so that we can retain them and also to invest in technology so that we can start to prepare for the future um, so that we will have the workforce of the future that's needed to provide the services we need. But we'd be happy to list out our key strategic priorities as well as those service lines that we uh, seek to continue because of community needs based on our community needs assessment. I appreciate the, the thoughtful response. And I just I want to end before I, I send it back to Chair Foster. Just um, I really I, I listened and heard the and recognized the recognition you're receiving from Leapfrog and Lown. Um, congratulations on those. And I think that focus on community and quality and reliability and safety um, is spot on. And um, Please keep going, and I hope the questions um, help you look under the hood some more. That's what we're may the taxpayers are paying were, us to do. May I say there were great questions, so we really appreciate it, Dr. Walsh. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll uh, go ahead and jump in with a couple questions. Uh, mine are, are mostly clarifying and uh, Tom's already asked some of them, so I should be relatively quick. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding sort of the differences between the projections um, and calculations that you provided on slide 12 with the uh, balance sheet or the, sorry, the, the revenue and expense statement that you submitted because they don't quite match. And I think it's because things are bucketed differently. So um i just want to confirm that in on your slide 12 you've included fixed payments in the other operating expense revenue is that right that's correct okay all right that the numbers still don't 100 percent line up but they're uh that i think is the big variance so thank you that's super helpful it's because it's because it's an, a run rate it's an annualized version of okay May. yeah got it all right thank you um 
And thank you for following up on the additional detail related to the commercial rate in terms of um, if you had said, for example, a 75% of your commercial volume came from out of state, I could understand why that the 4.7 wouldn't have a big impact on Vermonters, but 25% while large uh, still seems like 75% would impact Vermonters. So I think having more background on that would be super helpful. Um, in terms of your partnership with the other hospitals in the collaborative, um, are you expecting savings at some point from that initiative? And if so, did you book any of those in 25 or when would you expect to see that? Uh, great question. I'll start with that, Laura. So I guess the first answer, Robin, is we better see savings from that collaborative. <laughs> and yes, we do expect it. So right out of the gate, there's membership savings, uh, substantial close to $100,000 a year in membership savings. Um, what is really planned is that there's substantial savings from a new group purchasing organization and arrangement as well. And what we're really looking to, to count on is direct substitution, not even asking any physician to change what they're utilizing, but saying this is the exact same item just from a different group purchasing organization, and here's what we can save. Um, we did not budget that for fiscal year 25 because we actually just joined in the collaborative officially, I think in July. Um, and so we have not budgeted that for fiscal year 25. I don't believe Laura, but no, we, we did not. What we did budget is there are shared service arrangements that we have with the retreat already. We share IT staff between the two sites, uh, and that is budgeted for fiscal year 25. What we hope from the collaborative is that we'll be able to actually have some fractional employees that will even be able to be shared amongst additional hospitals. But it's all still in the planning process, I hate to say at this point in time. The tangible is the membership uh, dues. And then uh, I, I believe what will come very rapidly after that is the savings of uh, through the group purchasing organization without any change in uh, what we're utilizing. And we're actually uh, going to be reporting on that quarterly to our board uh, because that's been a big part of this change with them as well is wanting to keep an eye on this uh, with us. I hope that answered your question, Robin. I'm, I don't know. Yes, thank you. Um, I was anticipating, given the given the newness of your collab, your newness into the collaboration, that it uh, it might take a while. But I just wasn't clear on on what you had assumed. Um, the other question I had um, was, and you you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, all of the materials, but in in your submission, in your workbook submission, there is the commercial rate decompensation table. And I was a little bit confused about the numbers in, in that table don't seem to tie out to the balance sheet, which they do for other hospitals. So, uh, and for example, it seems to indicate that the rate in impact of the commercial rate increase is negative, which isn't really jiving with what your narrative says. So um, I don't know if you have any way to explain that or if that's um, maybe a follow up with our staff. I think it would be best as a follow up to this with the staff. Um, I don't. I guess I'm not clear on how revenue. Um, how you how are you tying it out to the balance sheet? Well, the NPR does not it's match. The PL, yes. It, sorry, the PNL. I misspoke. Oh, okay. But it it does like the for example the project. I was trying. I'm trying to follow projections, budget to budget, and then projections to budget, and the projections to budget don't match. For example, um, we and we don't have. We don't need to definitely. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll schedule some time with Alina uh, and. Yeah, and there might be uh, some versioning we have to look okay. at. But I know there's some discrepancies between the payer revenue and the income statement, so we'll need to connect anyway, Laura. But we'll we'll do that. Okay, okay great. Robin. I just was I was confused, and so I just wanted to see if okay. we could clear that up at some point. Thank you. I, 
I think I figured out that the workbook for them is still based in gross revenue as opposed to net revenue. That when I did, I was struggling with this too, and I think that's where I figured it out. But I may be wrong. It's not. It's not gross. Well, it doesn't uh, seem the, like it, it's necessarily. Uh, well, Dave, I leave it to you if you want to yeah, go, right. go down fine. the rabbit hole now. But that's yeah, fine. I think it's just yeah, it's got weird. It's like got more bad debt than. Anyways, yeah, I think it's just not right. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's all I had, and if I miss something, I'll pop back on. But I think I think that's it for me. Thank you. I mean, I, just, I mean, I was looking at this and I, that's what I tried to figure out, but I'd love to have a cleaned up workbook that we can use. Um, yeah, we can do that. that. That makes more sense, but I'll just continue. I just had um, one more question, which was regarding the Wyndham Birthing Center. Is that the OB center within the hospital or is this a freestanding birthing center? Wyndham Birthing Center. Uh, um, sorry, we have, a, we have a birthing center in the hospital. Okay, uh, and I think we have four seasons um, OBGYN practice. Okay, there are no freestanding birthing centers around us. Yes. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. That, you that's bet. the only question that I thought I picked up on the. Maybe I misread the, the uh, mission, but I thought I saw something about aging, working with Wyndham aging or anything. Maybe that, Dr. Merman. Don't know if that. Jumped out, or is that? I don't think that could was be my there. bad in my in my notes. So, but thank you. Uh, I just had a couple. I guess I'll call them little quick questions. Oh, go ahead. Um, oh, sorry, Jess. Um, on the um, narrative, you described um, one hundred and six thousand dollars to the lobbyist group Vaz. Um, is that fairly steady every year? And what is that based on? It is fairly steady every year. Um, and it's based on our participation in the VAS program as well as a AHA. Um, and it's, it's just membership dues, essentially. Based on your total revenue of the hospital? Uh, yes, there's a calculation. And, and actually, as a follow up to one of Robin's questions, we actually, through the collaborative, will get a discount to AHA uh, membership, which is actually probably another $20,000 a year savings that we'll get in a discount from them for that through the collaborative. And then the other part of this question asked about any um, marketing, advertising, or, or branding, but I didn't see any listed. Is that because there's none or? Um, it, it's just a sort of a neg negligible amount is what I would, how I would characterize that is uh, not, you know, just to give you a, a scope, you know, we don't report it even on our 990. It's not, I would say it's uh, insignificant. Um, and then LeapFrog, I, I, I haven't gone back and looked at it more recently, but it looked like a number of hospitals in Vermont don't participate in the survey. Why, why do you? I would defer to Dr. McGraw on that one. Yeah, um, so I'll say that uh, LeapFrog is able to pull uh, a lot of data from publicly reported sources. You can also engage in a more in-depth um, survey with them. We actually don't do the more in-depth survey. Um, our grades are based on the public reported data that they pull. I don't believe that they pull from critical access hospitals, so that limits um, who they're working with. Um, so there's there's some, you know, just programmatic limitations about who's included in that. Right. Yeah, they have the larger hospitals. Um, okay, so why don't you do the more in-depth survey? Um, we've looked at it a number of different times and we're not averse to doing so, um, but uh, it is very involved and it, it requires quite a bit of a commitment of staff time. Um, and with limited staff, we're really focusing on where we get the most bang for our buck, as it were. Um, and so really focusing on our quality patient safety 
initiatives that we've been doing rather than on the grading criteria that um, um, LeapFrog does has seemed the um, most expedient way for uh, quality improvement and patient safety improvement this far. I would not rule it out in the future. It's just not the path that we've uh, taken as the priority at the moment. Um, and then the provider tax discussion um, I thought was interesting. I have to admit that I'm not that well versed in the provider tax. So some of this is a little bit new and I apologize if my questions uh, show some of my ignorance on the topic. So you pay in 6.7 up to 7.2 million, you get back 670K going down to 630K. Um, and the money goes well, the money goes to Medicaid, right? So well, six, six, 640 in um, FY24 and 6, Oh seven in FY twenty five. Oh okay, all right. So and, and Chair Foster, that is what we pay. Is that yeah. about six point five? And then there's a federal uh, match to that. So, quite honestly, to the state, we're worth about thirteen million or plus in terms of tax. Uh, and then where that goes, yes, it goes to Medicaid, but I believe it goes to other programs as well, because I think if you took the totality of all the provider tax with the federal match, it would probably be greater than the, the total cost of Medicaid in the state, but I'm not positive about that. And I can ask my other state colleagues, but do you have any sense of um, what that money is used for? I assume it's a wide array of things. I, I'm sure it's very good things. I, I, yeah. I, I actually asked our legislative delegation about that uh, as well, and uh, they were not necessarily sure. They talked about their role, and um, I think from my perspective, I think that's a great thing from a collaborative uh, work across the state that um, to try and really look and see. I, I, Dr. Hamery, I think had mentioned in his recommendations that he thought there was enough money to sort of fund the future of healthcare here, uh, but it may need to be reallocated. And I think it would be wonderful to see in a very transparent way how things flow, because uh, I'm not, I, I'm sorry to say, I'm not sure how it all flows. Um, uh, and I, I didn't seem like our legislative delegation also really completely understood that. And I, I think taking that big picture would be a really important thing for the state in a very collaborative way. And we just approved rates the other day and help us if we're not spending enough on health care at this point. Yes. Yes, um, indeed. Um, uh, that's that's all I had. Thank you. I appreciate your presentation today. Thanks, Chair Foster. I think last but not least, for the end of a long day, here is me. Um, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for all the hard work you're doing um, on the quality front. There's some impressive uh, accolades coming your way. Deserved. A um, couple quick clarifying questions I've been asking all the hospitals. So I'm just trying to get a sense of the 4.7 commercial rate increase, how that's distributed across inpatient, outpatient, and professional. Is it equal 4.7 across all, or is there some distribution other than that? Um, well, it's mainly, there's a difference between professional and facility, um, obviously, uh, but yeah. It's pretty much across the board on a facility. Okay. Um, and is there, do you have an assumption uh, in the budget for what the Medicare Advantage rate increase would be? Is it different than your Medicare assumption? No. Okay, so it's the assumption is 2.9, similar yes. to your IPPS? Okay. Um, in the, the narrative, uh, there was a question about investment income, um, and the response was, we're not able to bud to project investment income at this time. Does that assume that you've budgeted zero for investment income? We don't budget for investment income. Okay. And what investment income was earned in 23 and projected for 24? We don't. We didn't project for 24. 
Um, okay. Might have to go and look at 23. 23, okay. That would be helpful. And you have, is there anything about actuals today, for example, of any earns or gains or losses on investment would be helpful to just understand for 24 to date? Just yeah, trying to get a sense into, of. I mean, it yeah. falls into our non operating section of our PL, uh, which is, you know, below the line. So we, you know, we typically wouldn't be reporting it. Okay. Well, anything that you can provide on past investment performance would be helpful to understand. Um, there, there was a large uh, projected 340B revenue for this year. About as, if I'm looking at this, and if this is the most up-to-date version, it's about 4.7 million um, on 340B, which seems higher than um, certainly the budget and higher than what you're. For 24's budget and higher than what you're projecting for 25, which is only 1.7. I'm wondering if you could just speak to that um, where, bump up this year. I'm on the I'm on the PL. So I'm looking at the PL and I'm looking at the line for 340B and I see 4.7 uh, million projected for 24. And then I see it go down to 1.7 for 25. And it was 1.6 in, uh, sorry, it was. The p &L, where, which, where do you have, that I submitted um, in, the, in the adaptive? <laughs> I'm in the workbook that I have. I can only tell you I have the workbook that was submitted. Um, I, I think we should just maybe, again, meet okay. offline so that I can review it with you because that's not correct. It shouldn't be anything more than, it, it okay. was flat year on year. Okay. So. There may be just a, you know, a, a error, user error or something. Okay, that's fine. It just seemed like it went up really high and I, and coming down, and I just was wondering if there was some windfall that you were nope, getting this no year that was fall. fantastic. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I guess my my last question is, um, you know, you described the need to recruit providers in podiatry and in cardiology to meet community need. Understandable given the aging of the population. Um, I'm wondering though if you could speak to the strategic decision to hide adi hire additional, you know, podiatrists, two additional podiatrists, two additional cardiologists, rather than increase the productivity of the existing providers. Looking at the work RVUs per clinical FTE, they're below, well below the 25th percentile for uh, productivity. So I, I'm just wondering if you could speak to the need to hire additional providers rather than increasing productivity. So I, actually, um, the worked RDUs that we have for these individuals at this point in time, uh, the podiatrist that we've monitored is actually a very new podiatrist. So he's in the ramp up phase. His productivity is actually now to a point where he's actually getting incentives. Uh, so he's starting to get to the 75th percentile uh, of his worked RVUs. The cardiologist was a transition. That had been somebody who had been working at Cheshire and has come over to us. Um, and uh, he is actually now uh, becoming incredibly swamped. Uh, that's a hard hire, the cardiologist. We have hired a second podiatrist. Uh, starts in September, a few weeks. But the cardiologist is 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 a need. Our cardiologist is ultimately going to retire at some point in time as well. So we need to to be making sure we have somebody in place. We used to get 1.2 FTEs from Cheshire uh, in Keene, uh, and so we also believe that with the growth in our community, we're ultimately going to need to be have 2.0. But it's going to take a while to recruit another cardiologist to this community as well. So it's in the budget for the hope of getting the recruitment done. Um, but the volume increases that Laura has uh, budgeted are actually really within the cardiology program as it is today. Okay, so maybe, I mean, this, I'm just looking at the clinical productivity submission. It looks like the year of the data was 23. Um, you know, so uh, if there's updated clinical productivity yeah. data that suggests higher, you know, relative to benchmarks, that would be really helpful for us Fantastic. to see. Thanks. We can do Thank that. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Um, I think that is all I have. 
Great, thank you. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Good afternoon. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief because I know it's been a long day. Um, I just wanted to ask a clarification about on your uh, income statement, it looks like you're budgeting $0 for ACO dues and 25 and $0 for insurance and $0 for marketing, which I know, Ms. Bruno, you talked about. I just wondering if you could elaborate on those decisions a little bit more. Again, we're, I, I don't know where you're seeing that. We're not budgeting $0 for ACO dues. Okay. Well, I'm glad to clarify it. Okay. We can touch base on that another time. Um, my other question was on, it refers to your audited financials, and you talked a little bit about the long-term debt and the uh, bonds that you have. It looks like a couple of them are variable interests, and you have these interest swap agreements. And I'm, I'm assuming that if you could have pursued fixed rate, you would have done that. But I'm just wondering if you've considered you know, refinancing those in any way or if that's not possible. Um, it wouldn't be possible at this point. Uh, we have spent the entirety of the 2019 bonds. We have a small amount remaining on the 2016, uh, which we are planning on spending on the, the MRI replacement. And um, so there's no real option okay. to refinance or anything like that. Okay, that's what I figured. I just figured I would, I would check. Um, and then my last question was, uh, in general, we've heard more about AI from you guys than any other um, possible so far, at least in my view. Um, and I, I've read some research that suggests that it'll reduce spending in healthcare by 5 to 10%. I, and I think we've seen similar estimates with EMR. So I'm wondering why you think AI will be different than EMR in terms of cost savings. Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll start that, Dr. McGraw, you might want to chime in. Um, so I, I think there's actually a, a very profound uh, projection for the future that, um, you know, everybody is worried that AI is going to mean people are going to lose jobs. What you hear is whoever doesn't embrace AI is, and, and is in the leadership role, they're going to lose their jobs because AI is going to actually have a profound impact. Healthcare always lags behind, um, but I believe, for what it's worth, that AI is different than EMR because the AI technology is really universal, whereas an EMR is only relevant to healthcare. Um, so uh, AI in other industries, so I mean, I, I, I don't know if anybody from the insurance industry is on, but they're using bots to actually manage their claim processing already. Um, people are far ahead of hospitals and healthcare in the use of AI. Um, and I, I think that it will have a very profound influence. And I can tell you as a patient, I have seen the, uh, the impact came from California before I came to Vermont and AI was already being used pretty rampantly in healthcare. And I saw the benefits as a patient ease of access, ease of connecting uh, with providers, ease of being able to communicate, uh, ease of paying bills, a whole host of different things that was foundationally driven by uh, artificial intelligence built into digital front doors and other things. This, this technology has a much more universal uh, uh, ramification than an EMR does. So that's my opinion, Sam, but I'll turn it to Dr. McGraw, who knows a lot more than I do. So one thing I, I, I think is a good example of the impact it's going to have is our AI scribes. So right now, when you go to see a physician, for example, they sit and look at the computer and type in a whole lot of things while you're sitting there. Um, with them, and that's really unsatisfying for you as a patient. And frankly, it's not the physician's whole job of that visit. And in fact, they spend hours and hours of what we call pajama time, which is finishing the notes about that visit with you uh, in the evening and getting those orders placed. And it's a huge physician dissatisfier, um, and in part it required by our EMR and all of the boxes that need to be clicked and checked and, and ticked and tied. Um, the, the thing about AI is it allows that visit to be um, in, in AI scribe is it allows you to have a natural langu language visit 
um, where the physician or provider is not typing everything into the computer, but having a conversation with you. And at the conclusion of that conversation, there is that note with the appropriate components in there. Um, and the physician then can uh, quality check that and make sure that it's at, at, uh, you know, appropriate for what it said. That is a huge uh, satisfier for clinicians um, to get their lives back um, and to not be spending all that, all that pajama time. That's a big impact, even if we're not even looking at, you know, any kind of, um, uh, you know, increased numbers of visits, although there may be some improvement in that, but there's a really big impact in terms of provider turnover, which is an extremely expensive part of healthcare, um, both for uh, do actual dollars and also access for patients. So that's just one example of the ways in which, um, you know, it's a, it, it's a benefit as opposed to the EMR, which has inadvertently created enormous impediments um, to our work workflow process. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. That's all I had. Uh, uh, can I just jump back uh, to Jessica's question about the 340B? Um, so uh, just to, to uh, kind of close the loop on that one, in December of this year of 20, December 23, so of the fiscal year 24, um, we received a recoupment from Medicare on our 340B program. Um, where we were part of that group of hospitals that was under reimbursed with between uh, 2018 and 2022, uh, we got a 1.9 million uh, recoupment from Medicare on uh, the 340B program. So it's essentially money that they owed us that we were under reimbursed for uh, within that 2018 to 2022 uh, period. And so if um, if I annualized uh, part of 24, it might have overrepresented that that number. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, okay. It, it, yep. inflated, it inflated our 340B number and then I annualized it, so. Okay. For the projection, yeah. So that's, okay. why, that's why there's a seeming to be a large bump in our uh, 340B reimbursement for 24 which will not continue in 25. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I think that's all we had for Brattleboro. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we have public comment that we take and you're welcome to stick around for it um, or, or to depart um, and then we'll end the meeting. But um, thank you for your presentation and your uh, submission to us. Thank you. Um, Via the raise your hand function, if anyone has a public comment, um, let us know. All right, I'll have a quick trigger today because it has been a long day and I see none. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Uh, is there any old or new business for the board? And I will move that we adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Thank you. And thank you very much, Michelle, for your work today and your help.